Good morning. Um, I've been asked to uh, just give a brief um, announcement regarding the formation of a new work group, which I was asked to chair and only too happy to do so. Uh, it's called, we're going to call it the Novel Influenza Vaccine Work Group. <clears throat> Uh, the rationale for this root group is that there are now two FDA-licensed H5N5 vaccines um, <clears throat> available in the United States, not for commercial use, not for general use, but only available for high-risk populations. And there is felt to be a need for recommendations uh, for use of these vaccines during a non-pandemic period. <clears throat> so we're going to be reviewing the evidence uh, for their use and making recommendations only in high-risk populations. Now, the ACIP was seen as the most appropriate group to develop these recommendations. <laughs> Uh, for these vaccines, and it was felt that the seasonal influenza work group was overloaded with work already so that we should form a, uh, uh, a, work, a separate work group to address this issue. <clears throat> so we've currently uh, formed the work group. We've had our first call. Uh, we plan to meet after the ACIP meeting to uh, the next two days. We're going to meet every other week for a while and then monthly. We anticipate coming back in October uh, with our report with a possible vote uh, scheduled for February. And then the future of the work group after that point will be determined um, based on w whatever other um, vaccines may, we may need to address. <clears throat> Here's the members of the work group. The ACIP members are myself, uh, Ruth Karen, and John Tempty. We have a number of very um, influential and knowledgeable liaisons and consultants, so it's a pretty high-powered group. Um, and um, I feel pretty um, privilege to be able to, to chair this group, and I look forward to the work we're going to be doing over the next uh, year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Campos Outcold. And now, uh, Dr. Curran. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to uh, bring to you this morning uh, to be able to introduce the, the work of the Influenza Work Group. Um, I have to say that, that we, we put the work in work group. We meet every other week, and sometimes we meet more often than that, and I am extraordinarily grateful to all of the people um, who take the time to help us uh, with, our, with our deliberations. I particularly like to recognize Lisa Grosskopf, who works even more than an average uh, work group member and has done... Uh, much of the great analysis uh, that you'll hear about today, in addition to many, many other things. Um, I'd also like to recognize uh, Sonia Olson and Leslie Sokolow, who are not on this slide, but who contributed tremendously to those analyses. Um, I'd particularly like to mention our ACIP members who are also on the work group, um, Jeff Dushin and Lee Harrison, and all of our ex officio members and liaison representatives who Con contribute tremendously to our to our discussions. So with all this work, what have we been working on? Well, we've been spending a lot of time uh, discussing and reviewing the evidence uh, for the relative e efficacy and safety of LAIV and inactivated influenza vaccine IIV in children. We've reviewed great analyses that you'll hear today. And we've also heard a safety surveillance update from VAERS and from the Vaccine Safety Data Link. MedImmune has discussed the issue of LAIV supply with us, and you'll hear a presentation from them today on that topic. And we've also heard from the US Flu um, Vaccine Efficacy Network about an interim estimate of the 2013-2014 seasonal influenza vaccine effectiveness um, some of you may have uh, heard this already um, via the, the press release and, and discussion, and we'll have some discussion here again today. So I'd like to say something about we, um, the del deliberations and grading for LAIV versus IIV in children were conducted independently, um, but we live, in a, we live in a global community, and I thought it would be useful for you to know something about uh, preferential LAIV recommendations currently in existence. So um, to my knowledge, LAIV is preferentially recommended in four countries at this point, the UK, Canada, Israel, and Germany. And I'll let you take a minute to, to read those preferential recommendations. They differ a little bit from country to country. 
Interestingly, in addition, we have a preferential recommendation for LAIV in two states in our own country. In Oregon, uh, where it's preferentially recommended for healthy children two to five years old, and in Washington State, where it's preferentially recommended for children two through seven years. So what we're going to discuss today, uh, Lynn Finelli will give an influenza surveillance update. Brendan Flannery will present the vaccine effectiveness estimate. Lisa will pre present the grade estimate uh, for efficacy of LAIV versus IIV in children. Maria Cano from the safety office will present the interim influenza vaccine safety update. Chip Walter from Duke will talk about comparative safety studies of LAIV versus IIV in children. Lisa will then present the grade uh, safety um, assessment. Kathy Cooling from MedImmune will give an update on the LAIV supply. And then finally, Lisa will review our annual influenza recommendations for discussion. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lynn Finelli for a presentation on epidemiology. Thanks, Ruth, and good morning, everybody. Okay, first I'm gonna talk about the virologic data. And these are data from the WHO and nerve system. You can see that this year, which is on the right, 2013-14, we had a predominance of influenza A virus. And of those viruses that were characterized, we had more than 95%, depending on the week, influenza A, H1N1. At the peak, we had 31% uh, percent positive for influenza viruses of respiratory viruses characterized. And in the inset up on the right, we're now at 14% positive, so we're starting to decline. Um, antigenic characterization, influenza A, uh, H1N1 viruses, we've characterized 920, and 99%, more than 99%, are characterized as A California, the H1N1 component of the 2013-14 Northern Hemisphere vaccine. Of the influenza H3N2 viruses, we've characterized 86, and 100% are characterized like the A Texas H3N2 component of the 2013-14 vaccine. And of the influenza B viruses characterized, we've characterized 50, and 62% are from the Yamagata lineage, and characterized as the B Massachusetts 2012-like um, virus, and influenza B component of the 2013-14 Northern Hemisphere vaccine, and 38% um, are Victoria lineage, uh, and have been from the B Brisbane 2008-like virus, and are an influenza B component of the 2013-14 Northern Hemisphere vaccine. Um, regarding antiviral resistance, uh, we, of the H3N2 viruses, none have antiviral resistance. Of the Bs, none are resistant uh, to antivirals. And of the influenza A H1N1 viruses, 3,471 viruses have been tested, and 26, or 0.7%, are resistant to oseltamivir, and none are resistant to zanamivir. ILI syndromic surveillance, these data are from the ILI net system, and these are providers, clinics, and emergency departments who report to us the number of total visits that they see each week and the number that are positive for influenza-like illness. This is the ILI net system coverage, and you can see that we have a lot of providers, those black dots, and places where people live in the US. This is um, laid over population density, and fewer where people don't live. Uh, we have about 2,900 reporters actively reporting this year in the ILI net system. These are data from those systems, and this is the percentage of visits for ILI for influenza-like illness reported by providers in this system this year. This, this year's data are in the red line, and you can see that this has been a moderate influenza season, and we peaked in week 52 at 4.6%. 
This is contrasted by the yellow line, which was last year, and we were at 6.1%. As you may recall, last year was a particularly bad flu season. So moving on to geographic spread, these data are from this week, um, February, the, the last week's reporting data, February 15th, uh, week seven. And you can see that we're mostly sort of starting to simmer down and we have local or regional uh, influenza activity geographically in most of the US. We do have some widespread activity still um, sustaining in the west and in the northeast. These areas notably were areas that had their flu season a bit later than other areas in the country. These are hospitalization surveillance data next, and these data are from the Emerging Infections Program, which are 15 jurisdictions in the US that do uh, population-based surveillance. Uh, these are rates of laboratory-confirmed influenza hospitalization surveillance from the FluServeNet system until February 14th from October 1st, which is week 40. This is our reporting season. You can see on the right side of the slide, we have an overall population rate of 26.1 per 100,000. This is contrasted with last year, where we had a rate at this time of about 35 per 100,000. As I said, last year was a more severe flu season. Uh, we have highest rates in those over 65, and there are 55 per 100,000, next highest in 50 to 64, then small children, 0 to 4 at 36, and you can see the rates cascade down after that. Now, I, I do want to draw your attention to proportionate uh, proportions of hospitalizations. These are proportions of hospitalizations in different age groups for the last five years. And you can see that this year, which is the bar all the way over on your right, 2013-14, we have the highest proportions of hospitalizations in those 50 to 64 and 18 to 49. This compares uh, to the pandemic year in the highest proportions of hospitalizations. So um, it's not just uh, that we have the highest proportions of hospitalizations in this age group just because we don't have a lot in elderly. In fact, we have highest rates of hospitalizations in this age group that we've had in several years. And, I, and the take home message from this slide is the blue line. The blue line is from this year if you can't really see the age inset. Um, the blue line are rates for 18 to 49 and 50 to 64 uh, for this year compared to the last three years. We have the highest rates of hospitalization this year for those two age groups than we've had since the pandemic. These are data from the mortality surveillance systems for influenza. These are the number of influenza-associated pediatric deaths by week of death from 2010-11 to the current time, February 15th. You can see on the very right that we have 52 deaths so far this year. The system tends to lag a little bit compared to influenza activity, so we do expect to accrue some more deaths this year. These are the pneumonia and influenza mortality data from the 122 city surveillance system from 2009 to 2014. We've had at our peak, which was about week two, 8.7 of all pneumonia and inf uh, of, of, of all deaths in the US were pneumonia and influenza deaths. This is contrasted with last year, which, which, where we had 9.9% of all deaths are PNI deaths. And I just broke out the influenza deaths this year to show you, again, we have the middle age age group a little bit more highly impacted. Now, if we looked at all pneumonia and influenza deaths, we would not see this change because we mostly have pneumonia deaths in the elderly. But if we just look at influenza deaths, we again see the 25 to 64-year-old age group with a higher number of deaths this year than in the past few years. This, um, again, is similar to the pandemic year, which was also an H1N1 year, where we had 555 deaths in this age group. This year, we had 352 deaths in this age group from the 122 cities. Uh, and the last couple of years, last year, 138, then 37 and 190. Uh, we tend to have uh, fewer deaths, uh, more deaths in the elderly in an H3 year like last year. Uh, where we had 556, and fewer in an H1 year like this year where we have 194. 
So in summary, influenza activity in the U.S. during the 2013-14 season began approximately four weeks earlier in November and occurred at moderate levels. Activity peaked in late December, early January, depending the area of the country, and influenza A, H1N1 viruses predominated. There are higher rates of influenza-associated hospitalization in 2013-14 in persons 18 to 64 years of age than during the past several seasons. And there were higher numbers of influenza deaths in the 122 cities mortality surveillance system in 2013-14 in persons 25 to 64 years than during the past several seasons. Now, why were young and middle-aged adults at higher risk for severe outcomes this season? Preliminary vaccination coverage estimates for this season and past seasons indicate that this age group has substantially lower vaccination coverage than younger people and then older age groups. And this age group may lack the cross-protective immunity to, to the pandemic H1N1 virus that's seen in adults over 65 years of age, likely acquired from past infection with antigenically related viruses. This age group had lower attack rates during the PH1N1 pandemic and may have less cross-protective immunity from that time as well. And as adults reach middle age, they start to develop the types of underlying conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and lung disease that increase the risk for complications from influenza, and, may be at, and they may be at higher risk for serious complications if they are infected. So I'd like to acknowledge the flu epi branch and my team, and thank you. I think there's time for uh, one or two questions here before we move on, if anyone has. Uh, just one quick question, Lynn. Um, uh, is there any uh, system that will track or monitor uh, numbers of deaths of pregnant women? Uh, from influenza. I'm aware of a handful in my state. No, no, there's not. There was a system in 2009, 10, and 10, 11, um, a, a pregnancy-related system, but that system is no longer in operation. Um, our pregnancy group here at CDC is very keen on reinitiating that system, but so far the states have not been interested in um, the resource uh, associated with reinitiation of that system. Thank you. Okay, wh why don't we move on to uh, Dr. Uh, Brendan Flannery uh, and the uh, interim estimates of 2013-14 seasonal influenza vaccine effectiveness. Okay, uh, good morning. I'm going to present uh, the mid-season estimates of the current uh, seasonal vaccine effectiveness. These are data from the U.S. Flu VE Network or Vaccine effective, uh, Effectiveness Network, and they're through uh, enrollment in January uh, up till January 23rd of this year. So this is the uh, the the current participation in the U.S. flu VE network. Uh, there are, are five participating institutions, uh, Group Health Cooperative in, in uh, the Northwest, in Seattle, uh, the Marshfield Clinic in Wisconsin, uh, the University of Michigan, and uh, the um, uh, uh, Detroit area, uh, University of Pittsburgh, and Baylor, Scott & White in Temple, Texas, and the and names of the principal investigators for each site are listed in this slide. Just as a review for the, the uh, methods that are used for estimating vaccine effectiveness in the flu vaccine effectiveness network, uh, the participating sites enroll outpatients six months and older with acute respiratory illness with cough and uh, less than seven day duration or less than eight day dura duration. Uh, these data that are presented for the mid-season estimates are from enrollment that began uh, December 2nd in one of the sites. Uh, the sites uh, begin enrollment when there is circulating influenza activity in the area, uh, and it goes through January 23rd. 
the the methods that are used uh, this is a prospective case control design uh, slightly different than a traditional case control design we call this a test negative design it's because all outpatients that are enrolled are tested for influenza by uh, real-time reverse transcription reverse transcription PCR and then we uh, look for the vaccination status of outpatients with confirmed influenza. We call those our cases. And the control group is really the outpatients that test negative for influenza by PCR. The vaccination status for this analysis is defined as at least one dose. It's essentially any influenza vaccination for the current season. Uh, the, the records are, are used at, at all of the sites, but essentially we have confirmed uh, validation or, or receipt of influenza vaccine at, uh, from uh, medical records or registries at two sites. And from three of the sites, we also accepted self-report because those uh, medical record searches are not complete. The vaccine effectiveness is estimated as a traditional case control study, one minus the adjusted odds ratio. The estimates that are presented here are adjusted for study site, uh, age, sex, race, ethnicity, self-reported health, and days from illness onset to enrollment. This year has been uh, predominantly a H1N1 year with uh, the vast majority in yellow here of um, that 2009 H1N1 strain being identified uh, among the positive cases at the sites. We've had, uh, in this analysis, there are 2,319 enrollees there were 66% negatives and about 34% tested influenza positive. Uh, among the 784, uh, we have um, 742 that were uh, 2009 H1N1. There are 23 that are A, non-typed. Uh, we only have 13 in this period of time that were H3N2 and only six influenza Bs. So we really don't have uh, enough uh, uh, H3N2s or Bs right now to provide any information about vaccine effectiveness for this season against H3N2 or B. The uh, enrollment it, it, by study week is shown here with uh, uh, influenza negatives in the blue columns. Uh, there were more controls or influenza negatives enrolled in every week uh, of this period. The positives are shown in the yellow bars and uh, they uh, the, the positivity ranged from about 30, uh, uh, 20 to 30 percent, and it's, it's dropped off slightly um, it, from the period of time when we enrolled uh, the last group that's in, in, included in this analysis. Uh, there's a, there are a lot of uh, numbers on the slide, and I'll go through here. Uh, first, comparing all influenza A and B uh, at the top. Uh, with the estimates just for the 2009 uh, pandemic H1N1 virus. Uh, there are about 50% of, of the, the influenza negatives that are, are vaccinated in, in among the enrollees uh, versus about 29% of the influenza cases or influenza positive outpatients. The overall vaccine effectiveness for A and B was 61%. The confidence interval was 52 to 68%. For the in 2009 H1N1, the numbers are very similar, 50% vaccinated among the negative, 28 vaccinated among the influenza positive, an effectiveness of 62% with very similar confidence intervals. And when we just look at the um, H1N1 uh, specific vaccine effectiveness, uh, the, the percentage vaccinated among controls ranges from 79% among our 65 and older to about 38% among the 18 to 49 year olds. Um, all of the influenza positive uh, groups, are, age groups, have much lower uh, percentage of, of vaccinated among the enrollees. And the estimates for vaccine effectiveness range from 67% with pretty uh, tight confidence intervals to 56% in our 65 and older with a, a quite a wide confidence interval. This is just a graphic representation of the uh, data that I just showed. These are uh, for all uh, uh, influenza A and B. Again, this analysis is one or more dose. 
uh, uh, and, and by age group. So we see a, a, a consistent vaccine effectiveness across all four age groups in contrast to what was seen last season with the H3N2 uh, with the wide confidence interval seen here in the group that's 65 and older. And just for comparison with other estimates of the pandemic H1N1 uh, virus, this, these data are from several different studies in different settings. Over uh, uh, four influenza seasons, there are estimates here from three different influenza seasons. Um, beginning with our estimate here from the, the mid-season estimate for the U.S. flu VE network, a uh, recently published estimate from uh, Canada from their surveillance system that, that monitors vaccine effectiveness, um, estimates from Spain, and again, these are just the H1N1 uh, specific estimates for each of these studies. Uh, then th these estimates are from 2011 and 12. This is from the U.S. Flu, flu VE network and then one from Canada from their uh, uh, surveillance system. Uh, Estimates from the 10-11 season from the U.S. flu VE network and an estimate specifically for the Marshfield population uh, that also participates in the U.S. flu VE network. Uh, an estimate from uh, Europe from their, their surveillance system uh, that is uh, uh, also it, it, in several different countries, a, a similar system to the system used in Canada. Uh, notably, all of these systems in Europe, in Canada, and in Spain use the same test negative design for their estimates. Uh, so d study design doesn't really explain the relatively small differences here. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to highlight there is a study that's recently been published. Uh, Mark Thompson is the first author. Uh, this was conducted in U.S. pregnant women, uh, the 10-11 and 11-12 season. Uh, this is an estimate for the H1N1 uh, vaccine effectiveness uh, for those two periods uh, uh, from this study. So the take home message is that uh, th the estimate that we see for the mid season is consistent with H1N1, 2009 H1N1 specific estimates that's been seen essentially since every season uh, since the 2009 pandemic. So the conclusions, uh, the, the uh, Predominant virus this season was the 2009 pandemic H1N1 virus, uh, and it was also identified as the predominant virus in the U.S. flu VE network. The interim adjusted vaccine effectiveness against this virus uh, for outpatient ARI was 62%, uh, with a confidence interval from 53 to 69%. The estimate was similar for all age groups that we looked at. Uh, it was similar to vaccine effectiveness for this 2009 H1N1 from previous seasons in a different settings. And these estimates are consistent with laboratory data for the current season uh, showing that the virus and the, the vaccine virus uh, remain a good match. Uh, final analyses for the 2013-14 season will investigate the effects of prior vaccination. And we also hope to be able to provide uh, estimates by vaccine type, specifically for live attenuated versus inactivated vaccine. Uh, our ability to estimate vaccine effectiveness for H3N2 or B infections this season will depend on our final sample size. And finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the many people at the participating sites and here at CDC that contribute to this analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are, are there any questions? Uh, Dr. Dushan. Thank you for the update. I have two questions. Um, one is, are you able to tell whether or not um, vaccine effectiveness varies according to whether the site used confirmed versus self-reported vaccination status in general? Could you repeat the question? Sure. About site? Yeah, whether your estimates of vaccine effectiveness vary according to whether this, the site um, uses confirmed versus self-reported vaccination status. We. So we will uh, perform an analysis at the end of the season that will look at, at site-specific estimates. Those have been presented to ACIP in the past. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to interpret some of the differences that we've seen uh, site by site. Uh, for this analysis, the vaccine effectiveness for H1N1 
has been similar uh, using the, the, the self-report data from all of the sites. And if we look at the comparison between the self-report and the medical record data from the sites that used both in this analysis, uh, the self-report, there, there are additional people we pick up as vaccinated using self-report information. So we think that the medical records aren't complete, but the data are very similar when we limit uh, just to the, to the, to the medical records. Uh, that's, there's not a large difference. So we don't expect a big difference when we uh, do the final analysis. Okay, thanks. And then the second question was, are you planning to do any analysis of um, vaccine effectiveness according to the duration between immunization and illness or the waning, you know, waning protection issue? Right, that's a big question for us in the influenza division. Uh, the, some of the data that I've shown are from a group uh, that uses um, Sentinel uh, uh, hospitals and, and outpatient settings in Europe specifically. Um, they have shown uh, uh, intra-season waning or uh, 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 the second half of the season uh, for several seasons where they had H3N2 predominant, they've shown lower vaccine effectiveness. We're still trying to address whether those are methodological issues or whether there's true uh, decrease in vaccine effectiveness in the second half of the se season. Their hypothesis that people who get vaccinated early and have a long time until they get infected uh, may actually have lower uh, levels of protection from vaccination. That would be a contrast to what we've seen with prior year vaccination offering some uh, long-lasting protection. So we're still working on on methodologies to look at that for the U.S. flu VE network, but we are planning to do that with these data since we have a unique opportunity to look at a virus that essentially has not changed and look at prior vaccination as well as the question of duration of immunity. Thanks very much. Dr. Rengel. Very nice, Brendan. Um, I know you said you controlled for um, self-reported underlying illness, um, but it'd be interesting to know whether the effectiveness varies by whether the people are healthy or not. Can you tell us something about that? In the final analysis, we actually use comorbid conditions that are defined based on identification of ICD-9 codes. Uh, it'll be transitioning to ICD-10 codes this year, so that there's verification, really, of comorbid conditions. For this analysis, it's only adjusted for self-rated health status. That's been shown to be correlated with comorbid conditions, but it's really not an analysis by comorbid conditions. That, that will be later. But, but can you tell us any whether the vaccine effectiveness varies by whether or not comorbid conditions are present or not? So the, the adjusting for this made no difference. Uh, we haven't done a separate analysis for different levels of self-rated health. And Dr. Klein Beasley. You mentioned that there were certainly wide confidence intervals for the vaccine effectiveness in individuals who were over age 65 for the H1N1 subtype. But even if you look in the first category of influenza A and B, there's a very wide confidence interval too. And I'm wondering, is that solely related to the fact that there are fewer people in that age range who are flu positive? Or do you think that there are other factors that give us um, such a wide estimate? Jeannie, can you go back to slide six? Uh, essentially, this this is a population, the 65 and older population is a more difficult group to enroll in outpatient settings. All five of the sites have made essentially extra efforts to increase their enrollment of the 65 and older, uh, but the, pers the number, just the number of, of people enrolled is actually uh, uh, our, our limitation. So the confidence intervals are wider because the numbers are lower, the percentage vac uh, influenza positive is similar in this group. And, and just as a side note for those of you who, who saw the publication from Canada, um, Canada has a slightly uh, younger population overall. They have uh, only about 5% of their population is 65 and older uh, the, for their enrollees. In, in our population, it's about 15%. So the, that rep represents the additional efforts that the sites have gone to to uh, in, in, enroll uh, patients 65 and older. That doesn't explain the difference uh, that was shown in Canada, but we really feel like the, the differences are, are uh, less than the similarities that the, the estimates for H1N1 are pretty similar.
That's correct. That's that's right. They're, they're, it's active surveillance. They're recruited a, and, and consented to participate in the study, and they all present to a participating clinic with acute respiratory illness and cough. Uh, just a small methodology question for what you're proposing in this uh, um, analysis of the effects of prior vaccination. Are you going to include the self-reports in that? It seems like for prior vaccination, your reliability may get a little bit less if, if it's based on self -report. Right, that's, that's correct. We do not include self-report for the analysis by vaccine type at the end of the season, nor for prior vaccination. Um, the, the, it's so difficult to tease out prior and current vaccination effects, and it's such a hot area right now in influenza that that's a, an, al an analysis that we limit to uh, verified vaccination. And Dr. Kimberlin. I was struck by the one third of tested samples that were PCR positive for influenza. In virtually all of the prospectively performed treatment studies, the rate of detection using similar methodology in terms of you know fever and cough and so forth has been two thirds. Do you have any, any comment on that? It, it's normally two thirds positive, one third negative. Yeah. We don't really need to go back to that pie chart because it's just one big yellow uh, graph. But uh, th for, for reasons of sensitivity and to try to get as many influenza positive cases as possible, the, all of the five participating sites have decided to use an acute respiratory illness with cough as their case definition. If they limit it to uh, ILI, people meeting uh, a definition of cough and fever, uh, cough and, and additional respiratory symptoms and fever for ILI, that, that would actually increase the proportion positive. So if it's an ILI definition like is used in Canada, the, the percentage of influenza positives actually increases uh, compared to the, to the outpatients that test negative. That's, that's a, a, a fever especially really increases the uh, specificity of this case definition. So that, that's a big difference with the U.S. flu VE network. Dr. Gorman. Follow-up question and small methodology question. Um, do you think the one-month discordance between your data set and the peak of the flu season, in other words, your data seems to be coming in in early January, the flu season seemed to peak in December, has any impact on your efficacy data? I don't think so. I, I suppose that there is a question about timing uh, and whether there is some change in vaccine effectiveness during the season. Last season with the very early onset of the flu season, some of the sites really had to scramble to begin enrolling patients in the, in the beginning of the season, and they also had a change at the end of the season to B, uh, a predominance of B circulating at some sites. It was good, actually, for the vaccine effectiveness estimates to be able to have enough Bs to look at that uh, by B lineage even for, for the final vaccine effectiveness that was presented here. So uh, I don't know that we haven't seen enough antigenic change in the H1N1 virus to say that we're not getting an ac accurate representation of VE because uh, of the period of time. And final analysis do control for calendar time because there are those differences of cases and controls that are enrolled by sites depending on their local flu circulation and when they start. So we do try to adjust for eff effects of time. I don't think it means in this particular case that, that we've missed the flu season or we're late in enrollment because at each site they essentially begin once they see flu. So it's, it's a more efficient uh, approach. And second short question, uh, two of the sites seem to have uh, electronic medical record capability, the ability to search medical records. Uh, would that make, if you limited your previous year flu vaccinations, would that be a possible way to look at that? So all of the sites have electronic medical records. Most of them also receive data from state immunization registries. Um, they also may receive inf uh, vaccination data from other sources. And uh, they do a, 
uh, extra effort at most sites if someone says they were vaccinated and they have a provider uh, the, the the study sites actually go after that information to try to document it so we have not seen a, a large difference with the mid-season estimates and the uh, full season estimates uh, where they're at the full season they're they're only verified uh, vaccination uh, there may be some that we are not able to verify uh, and the previous year's estimates seem to be going down from the early to the mid-season to the uh, end of season. But some of that is what uh, Dr. Reingold mentioned about uh, our final adjustments for comorbid conditions and other things we can adjust for. But I don't think we're, we're missing things because of the, the, the way that we're using vaccination status here. And Ms. Stinchfield. Patsy Stinchfield from NAPNAP. Thanks for the nice talk. I really appreciate the emphasis on um, the outpatient, and I'm thinking about how we communicate this, and it often gets translated to do vaccines work, and here's the percentage. People want a number. But this is vaccine effectiveness, yeah, ARI in an outpatient setting, which doesn't fit on a tweet, right? Um, doesn't fit on a headline. And I think that um, as we communicate about this, really emphasizing these are patients in the outpatient setting who presented to uh, to clinics, not overall vaccine effectiveness against all influenza. And wondering also about um, looking at um, effectiveness with uh, inpatient hospitalizations and impact on deaths. So those are two areas that we're very interested in. Uh, we're interested in, in um, looking at the impact of vaccination on hospitalizations. Those are difficult studies to do, and CDC does not have a surveillance system that looks at inpatient vaccine effectiveness currently, uh, but it's something that we are interested in. And we are interested in looking at the effectiveness uh, against pediatric deaths specifically because of the pediatric mortality surveillance system, and, and the question is to try to find a, a good comparison group to be able to look at uh, what we would expect for vaccination in that population. But as noted in the MMWR uh, last week, the, the overall uh, vaccination is much lower than we would expect in groups that are hard hit this year, and, and in the pediatric mortality surveillance, uh, the percentage vaccinated is much lower than what we would expect. So those are two areas where we're we're, we're very interested, especially for the communication messages and how important vaccination is to prevent the severe outcomes. Uh, Ms. Pellegrino. Just a quick follow-up question on that. You said that the um, vaccination rates are lower among the 18 to 49 and 50 to 64 populations, but isn't, isn't that true every year? Right. I'm sorry, did I? I meant um, so that, I was just I meant that the... The message from the surveillance that that population was hard hit, mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to be able to have vaccine effectiveness in inpatients in that age group to say that the vaccine is effective against inpatient disease. Uh, that, that is right. true that every year yeah. that has, that's been true with low vaccination coverage, but this year that's been a focus of media or communications messages about this is an important group to vaccinate. They have severe illness and hospitalization rates are high. Thank you very much. Let's have Dr. Grosskopf. Uh, and I think a presentation on effectiveness of LAV uh, versus IIV for healthy children. Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, so our next block of presentations is going to focus on the grade evaluation. Um, there are two grade presentations, one for efficacy and one for safety. And um, in between those two, we have a couple of presentations that are uh, related to safety that are going to help frame um, that presentation. Um, so I should also mention before we start that um, at present, at least the work group has not proposed a change in the recommendations. Um, um, for this population this year, we anticipate that there's going to be more discussion and we'll be coming back in June. But we did want to take the time to discuss the review of the evidence for today. So just to some background, healthy children aged 2 through 17 years may receive either live attenuated influenza vaccine, LAIV, or inactivated influenza vaccine, IIV. Um, 
Several studies indicate that LAIV may have advantages over IIV for children. This is somewhat in contrast to adults for whom comparative studies have generally indicated either that the two vaccines are similarly efficacious or perhaps that the inactivated vaccines are a little better. Um, but particularly for younger children, there are several lines of evidence indicating better vaccine efficacy for LAIV, um, better onset of immune response and duration of immunity, as well as better heterotypic protection against drifted strains. Uh, the ACIP currently expresses no preference for LAIV versus IIV in this population. Um, however, there have been, as, as uh, Dr. Karen alluded to in her introduction for this session, recent recommendations expressing some degree of preference for LIV for children. By recent, I mean um, within the last two years, 2012-2013. Um, this would be Canada, the United Kingdom, Israel, Germany, um, and also Oregon State and Washington State. Um, as you can see, the age um, specifications for the preference are somewhat different from place to place, with Canada, the UK, and Israel um, making this preference for ages 2 through 17, um, and Germany, Oregon, and Washington expressing the preference for a younger age group within that larger group of children. Um, just to frame some recent background on what we've been doing, um, many of you remember that um, we had a preliminary, preliminary grade efficacy assessment presented at the October 2010 ACIP meeting. Um, at that time, the safety assessment was deferred um, in large part because the trivalent LIIV formulation, or LIIV3, was uh, anticipated to be replaced with a quadrivalent formulation for 2013-14, which has happened. Um, and also we were going to be getting some quadrivalent inactivated vaccines, and no post-marketing safety data was, was yet really available for LAIV. Um, the objective for today's presentation is to describe both the great assessments for safety and efficacy as they are right now um, of LAIV versus IIV for healthy children. So the policy question was essentially, should LAIV be recommended preferentially over IIV for healthy children? And the reason that healthy children were selected for this initial assessment is that at least at present, um, the ACIP recommendations do not recommend the use of LAIV um, for children who have chronic medical conditions or conditions that propose to a higher um, risk of influenza-related complications. Um, we decided to split um, the age group of all children to two age ranges, age two through eight and age nine through 18. Um, the rationale for the selected age categories and the breakpoint um, at eight years um, uh, kind of reads as follows. Um, LIV is not li yet licensed for children under two years of age, so it was fairly easy to set the lower bound um, for that younger age category. Um, it's a little more tricky to describe the upper bound. Um, as noted a little bit earlier, at least for adults, um, it is not clear that LIIV is better than TIV or IIV, rather, um, for, for older populations. It's not clear, at least um, to our reading of the literature, exactly where the transition of the relative benefit of IIV starts. Um, so there wasn't really a firm um, literature-based pin um, that we could um, hang everything on. However, eight years is the upper limit of the age range for consideration of whether a child needs one versus two doses of influenza vaccine. So we selected this upper limit for the lower age category um, for simplicity of recommendations. Briefly to go over the study inclusion exclusion criteria, included data pertaining to healthy children. Um, primarily, one caveat is that we did review one study of children with asthma. Um, vaccines licensed in the US are similar to US licensed vaccines. Um, studies including both LIV and IIV arms, so we did not entertain for, for this particular evaluation study of either vaccine versus placebo without the other vaccine. Um, and this is also literature in English. Excluded were data for adjuvanted whole virus and virusomal vaccines, um, data for LIIV produced using different seed strains from US products, for example, um, uh, Russian-made um, LIIV. Um, studies in which all participants were outside of the indicated age range, for example, studies for which um, the entire study population was under the age of two, we would not include. Um, and studies um, with the outcomes being based on ICD-9 codes only. Um, the influenza work group had several discussions about um, generating lists of relevant outcomes and also assigning values to them. And this summarizes the efficacy outcomes that were selected. Laboratory confirmed influenza was regarded as critical for policy decision making. Influenza related mortality also critical. Influenza related hospitalization critical. And medically attended um, Medically attended acute respiratory illness also critical. Um, in the important but not critical category, we have influenza-like illness and influenza-associated acute otitis media. 
Um, literature search through PubMed um, ended up netting for us a total of 10 um, papers. We have five randomized trials and also data from five observational studies. Um, the next two grids just summarize some basic characteristics of the studies. The first goes over the randomized trials and the second goes over the um, observational studies. Um, we had a total of, again, five randomized studies. Two of these were open label. That's Ashkenazi uh, 2006 and Fleming 2006. Ashkenazi 2006, we'll be just discussing quite a bit today. Um, that's a study of children 6 through 71 months old um, with a history of recurrent UT uh, RTI, respiratory tract infection. And Fleming is a study of children 6 through 17 years with asthma. Um, for the placebo-controlled studies, we have Belshi 2007. Another one we'll be discussing quite a bit today, Newsel 2001, and Clover 1991. Um, Belshi 2007, ages 6 through 59 months, um, and Newsel 1 through 15 years. Clover, similar to, to Newsel, a, a broader age range of 3 to 19 years. Um, all of these, with the exception of Newsel et al., were conducted over one influenza season. Newsel was conducted over five influenza seasons. Um, of note, um, Fleming, Newsel, and Clover um, included both age groups of interest, and the data were not stratified for the outcomes of interest. Um, so that had some implications for how we carried out our analysis that I'll go over briefly later. Um, in the outcomes on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see that, not surprisingly, not every study included every outcome. Um, we had the most, uh, most data available for lab-confirmed flu. We didn't have any for flu-related mortality. Um, and then there were a smattering of other outcomes among the other studies. Um, these are the efficacy papers and studies identified um, for observational studies. Um, of note, Trainer, um, Omit, and Fry are three consecutive seasons from U.S. Flu VE Network. Um, McIntosh and Ike Coster from the Department of Defense, and these contributed to the assessment of laboratory-confirmed influenza. Now, um, before moving on to more, uh, more data in more detail, um, because lab-confirmed flu is such an important outcome and because it figures sort of heavily into the discussion, um, I'm not going to go through this in, in, in a lot of detail, but I just wanted to mention um, something with regard to what prompted children in these studies to get cultured for flu. Um, they weren't cultured blindly for each study. There was some definition usually based on clinical illness. Some of them were more detailed than others, if you look at Ashkenazi and Fleming in particular. Um, for what were the criteria for actually obtaining an influenza culture. Um, the the take-home message here is essentially that there, in general, was manifestation of an illness, although if you look at Ashkenazi and Belshi, there was also, um, cultures could also be obtained at the investigator's clinical discretion, if even if the child didn't quite meet the definition that was cited. And the last slide before um, data. Um, Data contributing to each outcome, um, on the, the last three columns to the right, we have um, the age groups for which um, we have the, and the number of outcomes that we have in each age group. For laboratory um, confirmed influenza, um, we have all 10 papers contributing. Um, seven contribute to the assessment of ages two through eight years and five to the nine to 18 year range. Um, mortality, we did not have any papers that reported that outcome. Um, hospitalization, two for two through 18, one for two to eight. Um, MARI, similarly, two for two through 18 and one for two to eight. Um, Influenza-like illness, one for two through 18, one for two through eight. And acute otitis media, um, two for two through 18 and the same two for two through eight. Um, so next, moving on. Um, this is the first of the evidence profile slides we're going to have. Um, the first outcome we're going to discuss is laboratory-confirmed influenza. Um, this was a critical outcome, as mentioned earlier. Um, and this first set of slides, again, is going to be for the two through eight-year-olds. Um, what you're going to be seeing on the next few slides is the evidence profile table up top um, and the forest plot down below. Um, for the forest plots, um, just to orient to those, if I can, there we go. Um, not working, okay. The line in the middle of the forest plots represents um, an OR or an RR, um, depending on the, the situation of one or no effect. Um, where you see the boxes and the confidence intervals to the left of that line, that favors the, out, um, the outcome is, in that case, uh, favored for LAIV. To the right, IIV would be favored. Um, so for laboratory-confirmed influenza, we have um, a total of two studies represented here. This is Ashkenazi and Belshi. Um, the, both of these have children in them that are younger than two years, younger than the indicated age um, 
for um, flu mist, but the majority um, were um, 24 months and older. Um, we did not downgrade for risk of bias, inconsistency, indirectness, or imprecision. Um, overall, there was a significant effect, um, beneficial effect of LAIV relative to inactivated vaccine with a pooled relative risk of 0 0.46 and a 95% CI of 0 0.39 to 0 0.54. Um, overall, quality of evidence was judged to be high um, or a type 1 for this outcome. Now, again, that, um, in that slide, we had all the data um, from those two studies without regard to age. Um, there was a meta-analysis published by Ambrose and Vaccine in 2012 that um, for this particular outcome did subset out the um, data for the children 24 months and up. Um, so we have somewhat more specific information here. Um, again, two studies. We did not similarly for this outcome um, or for this subset of this outcome downgrade um, for any of the four parameters. Um, we again have a significant effect with a, a similar relative risk of 0 0.47 and only actually a very slight widening of the confidence interval which we would anticipate since we have slightly um, less data. Um, overall quality of evidence um, was assessed as type one or high. Um, next, this is laboratory confirmed influenza from the observational studies. So here we're dealing with odds ratios rather than um, pooled RRs. Um, again, we have a total of five. Um, now you probably uh, remember from the earlier slide where we summarized the characteristics of these studies that um, the age ranges for these studies were somewhat disparate. However, we were fortunate in that the investigators for these studies were able to give us the data parsed out into the age categories that we um, wanted to analyze. Um, so. In this case, this is two through eight-year-olds represented in this slide. Um, we have a total of five studies represented um, over a total of three different seasons. Um, you can see that the, um, there's a little bit of um, scattering of the point estimates. Those are the red boxes in the forest plot. However, there is appreciable overlap of the confidence interval, so we did not downgrade um, for inconsistency on, in that regard. Um, the confidence interval is a little bit on the wide side, um, and on that basis, we did downgrade for imprecision, which brings the overall quality down from three, which would be the, the sort of baseline quality for observational studies, down to four or very low. Going to move on to a different outcome. This is um, influenza-associated hospitalization. That was what we were aiming for anyway. We did um, we preferred to have an, a more specific um, hospitalization outcome rather than all-cause hospitalization. Um, we have one data that um, contributed to this study, although it's strictly speaking, um, this was Ashkenazi, um, was not, um, at least through our reading of the methods, not reporting specifically influenza-associated hospitalization, but hospitalization for, quote, unquote, the current illness um, uh, among those um, children who exhibited system, uh, symptoms. Um, so this really is more similar to ILI-related hospitalization than flu-related hospitalization. Um, and so we did downgrade for indirectness on that account. Um, we also downgraded for imprecision um, on the basis of the wide confidence interval, which you can also see um, straddles one. Um, so we have no significant effect here. On the basis of downgrading for the imprecision and indirectness, our overall evidence quality is type three or low. For medically, um, acute, uh, medically attended acute respiratory illness, um, this is another um, outcome for which we obtained information from Ashkenazi et al. Um, in this particular case, um, we also have no effect. The, the point estimate, it's only one study, the point estimate of, of this um, RR does fall a little bit to the side um, of favoring LAIV, LAIV, however, does cross one. Um, we downgraded for um, indirectness on the basis of the fact that MARI is not a specific flu-related outcome. Um, and the um, overall uh, type of, of uh, evidence here was estimated as two or moderate quality. Um, next, influenza-like illness. Um, this was, we're now moving from the outcomes that were valued as critical to the outcomes that are evaluated as important but not critical. Um, ILI is um, one of those two that we have. Um, so for influenza-like illness, we did downgrade for indirectness, again, because it's not a specific um, influenza-related outcome. Um, here again, we see no effect. Um, our, our, our one box straddles 1.0 for our pooled relative risk. Um, we did not downgrade for any other parameters um, for this information. Overall quality of evidence is two or moderate, again. And finally, um, for two to eight year olds, our last outcome is um, acute otitis media. This is data again from randomized studies. Um, both Ashkenazi and Belshi reported information on influenza-associated otitis media. 
Um, we see actually here a significant effect with a pooled relative risk of 0 0.47, um, confidence interval 0 0.3 to 0 0.73. Um, we did not downgrade for risk of bias and consistency and directness or imprecision and judge the overall quality of evidence in this particular case to be high. So um, next, moving on to the 9 through 18 year olds, the older children, um, we do have less data here. Um, in this particular case, we have uh, a total of um, five studies. These are our observational studies. Similarly to what we saw with the younger children and lab-confirmed flu, um, we have fairly broad confidence intervals, and our pooled um, confidence interval is also um, fairly broad, crosses one, so this would be an estimate of no effect. Um, we did downgrade for imprecision. That brings our evidence quality down, since this is an observational study, from three to four, or very low. Um, with that data presented, um, there are a number of other considerations that are, are important um, as we go forward and formulate any kind of decision. Um, one is that um, harmonization, harmonization with the AP recommendations um, is something that's um, considered desirable, and we anticipate that there's going to be more discussion on that matter in the coming months. Um, LAIV supply, um, if we're going to have a preference, is also going to be an important consideration, and we're, we're fortunate enough to have, um, we're going to have Dr. Cooling um, from MedImmune present an update on LAIV supply later this session. Um, and then there's also the issue of safety of quadrivalent vaccines. When these papers that we've discussed were done, um, everything was trivalent. We now have um, a quadrivalent LAIV that has replaced the trivalent formulation, and we have um, both trivalent and quadrivalent inactivated vaccines on the market. Um, so um, safety data going forward, no matter what happens, is going to be important. But we're also going to have um, a presentation from the Immunization Safety Office, um, I believe just after mine, and then some more safety discussion after that. Another thing just to briefly mention is um, you know, considerations of cost. Um, this is a little bit difficult to sort out very cleanly because while we have one LIV product, we have a very, very frighteningly large number of inactivated vaccine products of different types and different presentations. We've got you know, syringes, single-use vials, multi-dose vials, um, quadrivalent, trivalent, so the prices are a little bit diverse. Um, what we can say, um, but based on what we know from the VFC information for the 2014-15 season coming up next season, is that the quadrivalent LIV cost there is roughly similar to that of the most expensive um, of the quadrivalent inactivated vaccines at this point. So to summarize just the outcomes again, going back to that, um, for our two through eight-year-olds for lab-confirmed influenza, critical outcome, we have evidence of decreased risk with LAIV, overall quality type one. From the observational studies, um, no difference overall quality type four. Um, we would revert to the, because we have good RCT data to that data and call that overall quality high. Hospitalization. Um, Another critical outcome, no difference, evidence quality three or low. MARI, a critical outcome, no difference, evidence quality two or moderate. ILI um, was important, not critical, evidence quality uh, two or moderate, also no difference. Otitis media, decreased um, risk with LAIV, um, overall quality one or high. For nine through 18 year olds, lab confirmed flu, no difference, overall evidence quality four or very low. Um, I'd like to um, thank Sonia and Leslie, and I would like to thank um, the folks for USV Flu, Net, Flu V Network and also the, the DOD who were able to assist us um, with data for this evaluation. We greatly appreciate it. And um, that is all I have for this presentation. We'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grosskopf. Um, I, I hate to say this, but the grade is almost starting to feel somewhat routine here. So uh, very nice presentation. We'll see if there are any questions. Dr. Kemp. Um, could you uh, comment on the, the other, I think, four countries that are currently uh, pro have a preferential LAIV recommendation for young children? Are there, are there different data that they're looking at that are not English um, mm -hmm. that you did not look at, for example? And also, could you comment on what kind of criteria they're using um, in terms of precautions for children with asthma, which of course would be the, the largest mm -hmm. group, and you know what cri kind of criteria those countries are using for use? Mm -hmm. um, so for the, the first question first, um, the overall, when, when the data are specified, which we, we aren't able to get for all countries, the, the papers generally are similar. Um, the most recent one, for example, Germany, um, Falkenhurst, Falkenhurst et al. published um, actually a great analysis of, of this very recently, and the literature is largely the same. 
um, although they, they, they did their analysis of, um, for older children slightly differently, used a paper by Fleming, um, which we, we mentioned briefly. Um, and for the, not, not, for not all countries do we know exactly what literature was cited, um, but in general, for what we do know, the, the literature is essentially the same literature overall. Um, for the question about um, folks with chronic illnesses, children with chronic illnesses, and particularly with asthma, this is obviously something we're very interested in because that's a group that's at higher risk of flu complications, so we would, of course, like to have um, you know, the best possible vaccine. Um, there is some variability, for example, in Canada, and, and I don't know if our, our NACI um, representative to the ACIP is here today, so if I misspeak, I hope, I hope she speaks out. Um, but my understanding is, for example, in Canada, um, for asthma that's controlled, um, there would not be any prohibition to using LAIV, and it's, it would be preferred in that population. Um, so not everything reads the same way that it, that it does for our current U.S. recommendations, and we anticipate that actually we're going to be have more discussion about that particular issue in the work group as well. I don't know if Ruth would like to comment on that. but uh, Dr. Warshawski. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Brian Warshawski from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization in Canada. Um, just a couple of points. We um, actually updated our, re our preferential recommendation in a statement in November of 2013 where we acknowledged that um, there's clear evidence from the two to six-year-olds, but the evidence up to 17 is, is not quite as clear in recognizing that it's not clear when the cutoff would be. Um, we did um, use the Fleming article um, in our assessment of the older age group. It's the one randomized trial that does go up to that age group. It is in asthmatics, but um, we um, felt that it, it offered um, some evidence that there is um, superior efficacy in that age group, although it's not clear again what um, when that cuts off, and it's only one study. And that was the reason that we re-looked at our recommendations to say, yes, we're clear on the evidence up to age six, but beyond that, we're not clear, and we're not clear exactly what the cutoff is. Um, our recommendations are for healthy children only. Um, we don't. Um, we we uh, recommend that the vaccine be used in um, in chronic illness conditions, not in immunocompromised, obviously, but in chronic illness. Um, but the, we don't have a preferential recommendation in chronic illness, um, and that's only because the data is not there to support that. It's mostly in healthy kids, except for that Fleming study. Thank you, uh, Dr. Decker. Data overall suggests that there's an efficacy um, uh, relationship benefit for LAIV in little kids, benefits for IIV in older people. It's not clear where the transition is. Presumably, the difference is because of, of uh, experience with the virus previously or experience with vaccines, something like that. So in, in that regard, the fact that the newest of the studies uh, looking at efficacy was conducted over a decade ago and the oldest almost two decades ago um, raises a question in my mind, and it's not that flu has changed, but the population's changed. I believe CDC data show that the young kids are far more likely to be vaccine experienced now than they were 10 or 20 years ago. So in that regard, I know that MedImmune is conducting a post-marketing commitment trial right now to generate current estimates of efficacy by year of age. In light of that, I wonder if the committee plans on waiting to see those data, or do they want to go ahead on the basis of these older data? I, I could, I'm sorry, so my, I couldn't hear the last sentence. The, uh, given that MedImmune is currently conducting a, an FDA post-marketing commitment trial to generate estimates of efficacy by year of age, and those would represent data relevant to the current situation and the current vaccination programs in the U.S., does the committee plan on waiting for those data, or does the committee plan on proceeding on the basis of these uh, 10 and 20-year-old data? Um, at, at this point, the, the work group is, is continuing to have discussions about a number of topics, and um, it, it is true that the, if you look at the Belshi and the Ashkenazi studies, which are, are, are a lot of what we discussed just now, um, that those were done at a time when a lot of those children, and, and in fact, most of them probably were vaccine naive just because of what the recommendations were at that time. Um, I'm anticipating we'll have some ongoing discussion about, about that issue in work group. Ruth, do you care to comment on? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think the only comment that I would make is that it, it certainly is true that 
many more, fortunately, many more children are immunized against influenza now than when those studies were done. I think that a relatively, currently a relatively small proportion of children are receiving LAIV. I think the data that I saw most recently indicates probably about 7 to 10 percent in that age group. We certainly know that with IIV, immunity wanes, and it wanes even in, you know, by the springtime. So I, um, I'm, I'm, on the one hand, I'm wondering if, if you look at an, a children with an IIV immunization background, which when we start out are most likely to be the majority of children immunized, um, I, I don't know that that will make a difference. I think the, I actually think that the best way over time to look at repeated LAIV immunizations is the kind of data that are going to be co collected by the VE network that actually stratify by immunization status. Because yeah, I think the concern is that as, as you acquire immunity over, over uh, repeated experience, you have enough nasal antibody that, that you, the, uh, um, the LAIV doesn't get the chance to stimulate an immune response before it gets squashed by what you already have. I mean, that's, I don't know that anybody knows for sure, but that's the conjecture as to why there's an age transition and after a while, IIV works better than LAIV. Okay, I guess we uh, ready to move on to the uh, uh, Dr. Uh, is it Kano? Kano, yes. Good morning. Um, Thanks for the opportunity to uh, present the interim uh, flu vaccine safety update for um, live attenuated and inactivated uh, flu vaccines in persons uh, less than 18 years of age. I'll uh, provide um, information from various surveillance data, uh, VSD rapid cycle analysis, uh, and uh, briefly uh, describe one of the uh, CISA study uh, plans. The uh, results uh, from uh, VAERS that I'll be presenting are from reports uh, with vaccination um, dates from July 1 through December 31, 2013. Uh, before going uh, through the um, data, uh, this table uh, summarizes the recently licensed influenza vaccines that became available during the current season. There was a complete switch to quadrivalent live attenuated uh, flu vaccine this season. Um, so comparison between the trivalent and quadrivalent uh, forms will be between seasons. Uh, for the inactivated uh, flu uh, vaccine, both uh, trivalent and quadrivalent forms are available and the comparison is done within the current season. The last column shows the uh, recommended age groups for the vaccines listed. Um, the uh, standard abbreviations are also shown and throughout uh, most of my uh, presentation, I'll be referring to the abbreviations. Uh, we reviewed uh, U.S. Uh, various reports after LAIV or IIV with report dates from July 1st, 2013 to January 31st uh, of this year, uh, with vaccination dates uh, from July 1 to December 31. Uh, as I uh, mentioned earlier, LAIV disease, uh, LAIV4 uh, disease is compared to last season's LAIV3. Uh, IIV4 versus IIV3 is within season comparison. Um, adverse events that were reviewed and coded into the VAERS uh, database uh, used uh, using uh, the International uh, Medical Dictionary for Regulatory Activities, uh, commonly referred to as MEDRA. 
Uh, MEDRA terms of note are, mu are not mutually exclusive and a report uh, may have several different uh, MEDRA terms. Uh, FDA uh, conducted empirical Bayesian data mining to uh, detect disproportional reporting in the uh, VAERS database. Uh, this slide shows the uh, strengths and limitations of VAERS, which most of you are uh, very familiar with, so I won't go over it in detail. Uh, some of the strengths, though, include rapid uh, signal detection, and uh, the data is also available to the public. Uh, some of the limitations are um, re reporting bias, inconsistent data quality, and uh, completeness. This slide uh, summarizes uh, U.S. reports to VAERS following LAIV uh, ages 2 to 17 uh, years, which is the recommended uh, age group in children. Uh, results for LAIV4 is shown in the middle column, and those for LAIV3 uh, are in the right-hand column. Uh, report is considered serious uh, based on the uh, Code of Federal Regulation, which is uh, noted in the uh, footnote. Um, a limitation of this classification is that uh, any reporter can classify an adverse event, even if it doesn't appear to be a uh, life-threatening, let's say, uh, condition, uh, which is uh, one of the um, criteria for a serious report. It's important to note uh, that, uh, to look at the uh, uh, percentage rather than the actual numbers when comparing the um, results. 9% uh, of reports uh, were classified as serious for both uh, vaccines. 46% uh, were in males for LAIV4 versus 47% for uh, LAIV3. Uh, as you'll note, um, the rest of the findings for LAIV4 and LAIV3 are comparable. Uh, this table compares uh, adverse events that are of particular uh, interest for LAIV. The terms are grouping of terms uh, based on uh, MEDRA codes. For anaphylaxis and seizures, uh, onset interval is uh, zero. Uh, which is the day of vaccination to one day after vaccination. Um, overall, uh, results for LAIV4 are comparable to those of LAIV3. For the current season, uh, approximately 12.5 million LAIV4 doses uh, were distributed, uh, whereas uh, approximately 13 million LAIV3 doses uh, were distributed uh, last season for all ages. Uh, there was no disproportional reporting in data mining for the uh, pre-specified terms uh, for this season uh, as of uh, January 31st. Uh, this table shows the top 12 MEDRA terms following uh, LAIV given alone. Pyrexia, as you'll note, is the most common adverse event for both vaccines. Most of the top adverse uh, events such as cough, vomiting, urticaria, uh, headache, um, following uh, LAIV also appear for LAIV3 from uh, last season. The next few slides are uh, results following the inactivated uh, flu vaccine in children for the indicated uh, ages uh, six months to 17 years. Uh, as a reminder, this is an in-season comparison between IIV4 and IIV3. There were uh, 121 total reports for IIV4 and 715 for IIV3. 10% of the reports were cl uh, classified as serious for IIV4 versus 7% for IIV3. Uh, gender, median age, median onset interval, and percent IIV given alone uh, are similar for both uh, vaccines. 
In terms of the adverse events noted for uh, inactivated flu vaccines, uh, results are overall comparable for IIV4 and IIV3. Uh, for this season, approximately 12.9 million IIV4 and about 122.6 million IIV doses were distributed for all ages. Uh, again, there was no disproportionate uh, proportional reporting in data mining for GBS seizures or febrile seizures or anaphylaxis uh, as of uh, January 31st. Um, this uh, table shows the top 12 MEDRA terms following IIV given alone, uh, ages 6 months to uh, 17 years. Uh, injection site erythema was the most frequent adverse event for uh, IIV4 uh, and IIV3. As expected, the most frequent adverse events were uh, injection type uh, of reactions, such as uh, injection site erythema, warmth, swelling, uh, pain uh, for both uh, vaccines. I'll now uh, present the findings from the uh, vaccine safety data link. Uh, rapid cycle um, analysis for the age groups indicated is performed for the uh, pre-specified outcomes uh, listed on this slide. Uh, with the exception of anaphylaxis, uh, the outcomes are neurologic uh, adverse conditions. Uh, this uh, slide shows the interim data for um, the rapid cycle analysis during the current season. As of January uh, 16, there were approximately 194 doses of LAIV4 dose 1 and approximately 3 million doses of uh, IIV3 dose 1. So far, there has been limited uptake of IIV4, uh, the uh, cell culture-based uh, and recombinant uh, trivalent uh, inactivated vaccines. Uh, there were no signals in rapid cycle analysis uh, for any of the pre-specified outcomes. Finally, I'll briefly uh, describe uh, one of the CISA projects. The project is a fever study in children ages 24 to 59 months uh, after LAIV or IIV using text messaging. Um, and this would be for um, years uh, 2012 to 13 uh, and 2013 to 14. Uh, Columbia University and CDC are conducting uh, this observational study of uh, flu vaccine safety. Uh, the study is to assess the rates of fever in uh, children receiving LAIV compared to those receiving IIV in the uh, zero to 10 days after vaccination. Uh, children receive uh, LAIV or IIV per usual care with or without other childhood vaccines. And then temperatures are monitored uh, daily uh, via text messaging. Uh, preliminary data is expected by uh, June of this year. In summary, uh, there have been no new safety concerns detected for the live attenuated or inactivated influenza vaccines during the season in persons less than 18 years of age in VAERS and VSD surveillance. The safety profile of LAIV4 versus LAIV3 and IIV4 versus IIV3 in persons less than 18 years of age are comparable. We are continuing uh, the flu vac uh, uh, vaccine safety monitoring in VAERS, VSD, and CISA. Uh, 
I'd like to uh, thank those listed on this slide, uh, especially Panina Haber, uh, who assisted in the uh, preparation of uh, the, this presentation, and for Paige Lewis, who uh, provided the automated uh, VAERS uh, data. Uh, thank you. Any questions? Dr. Kern. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. I have a question about um, slide 10 in your original group of slides, which were the top MEDRA terms following LAIV administration. And one of those top six or so is injection site erythema. Ah, uh, yes. I was wondering if you could comment on that in the context of LAIV. Uh, let's see here, IIV. Uh, it's slide number 13. Yeah, there's a higher, as you'll note, slightly so, higher. Sorry, 24%. Slide 10, 10, ten or oh, the 10, erythema. Okay. Okay, 10. Uh, 10 for. Oh, I think it's, it's in the in extra slides. Out, we actually took that out. Yeah. Our... Yeah, that was, yeah, it's in the okay. extra slides. Yeah, that would be uh, LIV is uh, given uh, also with the uh, injectable, other injectable vaccines. So uh, that's why you're seeing local types of reactions. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Sawyer. Uh, I was Mark Sawyer from Peds IED Society. I was surprised by the low uptake of IIB4 in the BSD study population. Is that representative of the distribution across the country, or is that an artifact of the VSD sites and decisions on by groups like Kaiser to not use that vaccine? Uh, is there someone here from uh, VSD who might be able to uh, go into more details? <laughs> uh, is this on? Okay, is it on? Um, yeah, I don't, uh, to answer that question, basically, I think we, we don't know. I mean, uh, for VSD, the, the, the data are what they are, but I'm not familiar with uh, what national data are in terms of uh, uptake or coverage with uh, LAIV. Uh, Dr. Rubin. Yeah, is it possible to break out the VSD data uh, in terms of seizures, just looking at the younger age group, um, because you, for LAIV, you have two through 49. If you just looked at the age group we're thinking about now, say up through age eight years, uh, is there any difference in seizures? Uh, okay, as I, I guess I should introduce myself. I'm Frank <laughs> Stefano from the uh, Immunization Safety Office at CDC. Um, to answer the question is, it is possible to, to stratify the data, you know, in other age groups, but. We, we haven't done that yet. So these are the strata we've used thus far. I'm Kim Bradley from GlaxoSmithKline. I just wanted to share that we did distribute 10 million doses of quadrivalent vaccine in the last season, just for your reference. This is Phil Hosbach from Santa Fe Pasteur. Um, we, we distributed about 7.5 million doses of quadrivalent, and our estimates from publicly available data is that uh, of all the quadrivalent vaccines available, which would probably include LAIV4, about 80% of it went into uh, six-month-olds to 18-year-olds. So it does seem like the data is a little off for these, these groups. Okay, I think we uh, continue on.